Unlike some other low-cost artistic mediums, making films is a creative pursuit which requires money. In cinematography, having a larger budget means having more control over creating images and sculpting light. Although that doesn't mean that it's not possible to make films with little or even close to no resources. Today I'll look at three different black and white feature films at three different budget levels. No budget, indie budget and industry budget. And analyze how each was shot using the resources at their disposal. As the name suggests, a no budget film is typically a movie made at the beginning of a filmmaker's career with little or no money, usually with the goal being to submit the completed film to festivals in order to make connections or raise money for future projects. Relics was the first no budget feature I shot. I photographed and co-produced it along with the director in 2015, with zero money, casting ourselves and our friends as actors, with an improvised script, shot over a total of 8 of our off days from work while living in Tokyo. Knowing that we pretty much had no resources to make the film, we were forced to embrace what little we had. I shot it on my old Canon 550D DSLR, which was able to shoot 1080p video. Because we were going to be shooting in a naturalistic, improvised documentary style, I wanted a wide-angle lens, which allowed us to see the characters interact with the locations, and which would minimize camera shake for unpredictable handheld work. I chose to shoot the movie on a 24mm f2.8 Nikkor Prime lens, which I used for stills. Shooting with manual gear allowed us to work in a documentary style, getting access to public locations without anyone realizing we were even making a film. We chose to shoot the film in black and white. Although we were aware of the stigmas of shooting contemporary films in black and white, filming in monochrome was the only way that allowed us to control the palette of the film and also served as a head nod to our French New Wave visual references. Because the dynamic range on the 550D was pretty terrible and we had no money for lights, we tried to always shoot in locations where the natural light was the best it could be. For day interiors, this usually meant placing characters near a window, where the natural light created a beautiful, soft contrast. For night or underground interiors, this meant finding locations with interesting practical lighting, which is enough to expose the scene. The key to cinematography with no money is in lighting through the placement and blocking of characters, choosing the right time and locations to shoot at, and by focusing on the variables which you can control, like framing, shot selection, and basic camera movement. The next tier up from this is low budget indie filmmaking, we have money to rent basic gear, pay actors and access locations. Alex Lehman's Blue Jay, which he directed and shot himself, is a great example of this. Lehman shot the film on a Canon ME20 camera, which is a high ISO camera, originally designed for military use with around 12 stops of dynamic range. We were definitely the guinea pig, and I chose the camera for a combination of budget and look. The camera comes with the ability to shoot in exceedingly low light conditions and has a large full frame 35mm sensor, whose perspective Lehman wanted to adopt. There have been a lot of films shot in large format recently, and you can create a different space that way, as you're shooting very close up to your characters without getting wide angle distortion. They shot simultaneously with two cameras to speed up the shooting process and get more coverage. I like the ability to have an A camera reactive to what the actors are doing and have a B camera shooting a safety shot so we don't miss anything important. Shooting black and white visually simplified the film. Removing the color removed any visual distractions so that the characters and what they were saying remained the focus. Although they had to move and shoot very quickly, having control over the locations meant that some basic lighting was possible. All we needed were some LEDs various light pads and practicals. I was even able to use some Christmas lights I took from my backyard, which gave a lovely glow to the actors' faces. So while this indie budget film still mainly shot with natural light, Lehman was able to use LEDs to provide a softer, more even exposure to scenes. Break up having a flat background by placing practical light sources in the background of a frame, and use a camera with enough dynamic range to help preserve the details in the highlights and shadows.
Now we come to a film made with ample resources from a standard industry budget. At this level, there's enough money to carefully select whatever technical gear is required, build beautiful sets, have a full technical crew, and space out the shooting schedule so that more time and care can be given to crafting individual shots and performances. So, with all the technical tools at their disposal, let's break down the gear which was selected to shoot the lighthouse. To achieve a textured, weathered, orthochromatic look which was appropriate to the time period, Jaron Blushke opted to shoot the film on Kodak Eastman's XX black and white 5222 film stock. He shot the film on vintage 1940s Bausch & Lohm Baltar lenses to further enhance the period look. To achieve the orthochromatic look, characteristic of early 19th century photographs, he got Schneider to create a custom filter. Because early film could only record ultraviolet and blue light, the skies, which contain a lot of blue, became bright and blank, while skin tones would record darkly with strong blacks. So blemishes and textures on a face were emphasized. This look not only evokes a bygone time, but further weathers the appearance of our salty, beaten down characters in the lighthouse. Shooting with a slow, old double X film stock meant that in daylight he had to light to 80 ASA, and when shooting with tungsten light, had to light to a measly 50 ASA. This meant that large, powerful light sources were required in order to have enough light to expose the film. For day interiors inside the lighthouse, he created what he refers to as a cyclorama. His lighting team rigged white muslin textile above the windows around the circumference of the lighthouse. Into these, he'd bounce two HMI M90s and two 18Ks. Having so many powerful sources brought up exposure enough to shoot at 80 ASA, and bouncing them created beautiful, natural, soft light. He utilized a range of grips gear, such as a technocrane and a dolly, to perfectly compose each shot and execute smooth, cinematic camera movement. So, with vastly increased cinematic control, from an industry-appropriate budget, Blushki was able to choose a very specific photographic medium which best told the story. Bounce many large and powerful lights to achieve a beautifully soft texture of light at a perfectly controlled exposure, and used grips equipment operated by a professional film crew to create precise, polished camera moves. Looking at these three examples shows that the main tangible asset that money buys in cinematography is control. Having a large budget allows the DOP the freedom to make whatever technical choices are necessary to best tell the story visually. Money doesn't by any means negate the influence of the cinematographer. Having more budget doesn't mean the images produced by the cinematographer will be perfect unless the DOP is talented, knowledgeable, thoughtful and deliberate. Likewise, having less budget doesn't necessarily mean that the visuals will be inherently inferior. Ultimately, although money certainly provides more cinematic control, the strength of the visuals are always reliant on getting the right DOP to execute the vision of the story. I'd like to thank everyone who has subscribed to the channel and continues to support these videos by watching, liking and commenting. Until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.